Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Like everything else of interest to our crack research staff, baseball is organized. The characteristic one notes is not restricted to organized baseball. The term organized baseball is usually applied only to Major League Baseball and the affiliated minors. It is not applied to the independent minors, leagues outside Canada and the U.S., and the uncountable number of amateur programs, including college baseball, designed to identify the best players at each age level and funnel them into situations that will facilitate the development and assessment of their skills. The taxonomy is sprawling and decentralized. The leagues and other associations are marked by arcane local mores, and the specifics change annually, with exhaustive information not to be found in printed sources. In short, the environment is an organizational dynamics researcher's dream come true. Canada's role in this playful yet competitive atmosphere seems ambiguous. Organized baseball seems to be losing interest in the country as a potential market for its product. The Montreal Expos were one of the two teams marked for contraction, meaning dissolution, this past winter by the major league owners. Vancouver, a member of the AAA Pacific Coast League through the 1999 season, was downgraded to the short season single A Northwest League for the 2000 season and has not gone back. The general unwillingness of Canadians to commit to paying literally any price to buy new stadia for their professional teams has been noted elsewhere. In other sports, especially hockey, the relative readiness of American municipalities to commit to any expenses that their professional franchises can articulate has been cited as the beginning of the end for Canadian pro sports teams competing with their counterparts south of the border. On the other hand, organized baseball has no reservations about using Canadian players. Canadians who played in the major leagues in 2001 include Stubby Clapp, Rael Cormier, Ryan Dempster, Rob Ducey, Eric Gagne, Steve Green, Mike Johnson, Corey Kosky, Aaron Mayette, Paul Quantrill, Matt Stairs, Larry Walker, and Jeff Zimmerman. The situation appears to be one in which Canadians will be allowed to produce and get paid for a product, but not to consume it. I spoke with Terry McCaig by telephone on May 30th. McCaig is the head coach of the University of British Columbia baseball team. The program had drawn my attention for two reasons. First, UBC is a member of the NAIA, a collegiate athletics organization based in the United States, and until recently, composed solely of U.S. college and university athletic programs. There are eight Canadian schools in the NAIA now, although in the interview you will hear, McCaig points out that only UBC has a baseball program. I wanted to know the attraction of the NAIA to Canadian schools, anticipating that it provided a higher profile for prospective professional athletes among the collegians, a way to draw attention from the money men in the American and National Leagues. Recruiting would naturally be more difficult for a school that gave its ballplayers no hope of moving on to more lucrative things after graduation. Second, Jeff Francis, a pitcher on the team, had been the first Canadian collegian to make Baseball America's preseason All-America team, this in January of 2002. Francis had distinguished himself not only through his play at UBC, but in various summer programs that showcased top amateur talent. At the time of this interview, Francis was being pegged as a high draft choice with all of the reports I saw projecting him among the first 10 selections. He eventually went ninth overall to the Colorado Rockies on the first day of the two-day draft, June 4, 2002. In this interview, 
I asked McCaig about, among other things, Francis's prospects, as well as those of Surrey BC high school player Adam Lowen, who eventually went fourth overall in the draft to Baltimore. If you could tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, yeah. where your uh, coaching career got started, and how you wound up at UBC. Yeah, I'm uh, starting my just got done my fifth year as the head coach at UBC. Got the opportunity to start the program from scratch in 1997, so uh, that was my first uh, coaching experience. I had played up to that point. Uh, got done playing in 1996, so it kind of fit in nicely in, in terms of a time frame. So yeah, I've been the head coach now for five years at UBC, and hopefully going to do a lot more here. It looks like you're off to a good start. You almost made the NAIA World Series this year. I've uh, been uh, keeping track of you, and it looks like you uh, missed it by one game. Is that correct? We lost in the regional final to Albertson College, and if we'd won the regional tournament, we would have been able to host the Super Regional, which was a best of three against the winner of California, which Albertson did and won that. So I think we, you know, technically, if we could have won that regional tournament, would have had a real good chance of winning the Super Regional against the California winner. And uh, if we would have went ahead and won that, uh, then you're at the World Series uh, in Lewiston right now. How did the decision to join the NAIA get made? What considerations came out during the process? Was this all your project, or uh, was this something that the uh, the whole athletic department decided to do? Uh, it was kind of a mixture. It was the thing that I, you know, ID'd right from the start when we started the program, when there was talk of starting baseball at UBC. Uh, I ID'd that as the most important thing. Either we get an affiliation with somebody in the U.S., or it's not worth doing. Uh, there was no point in doing a, an exhibition program or something that kids weren't playing for. I played at the National Baseball Institute back when it was going out here in Surrey, and, and it became very difficult to recruit kids and to you know, play seasons where every game's an exhibition game where it doesn't mean anything. So that was one of the things that I talked to the athletic department about right at the start, and they assured me that you know, as we got going into the program's history that that would be the first major step that they made from their end, and sure enough, they did after two two years of playing kind of a club team level where we were playing exhibition games. Uh, I think the year 2000 was actually our first year in the NAI. So the university, the athletic department made the decision to go ahead and move baseball into the NAI and actually have now joined golf and, and cross country and track and field in the NAI also. So uh, it's kind of a mixture between, between myself and the baseball program and Bob Phillip and the athletic department. So the major issue was recruiting. The kids just weren't going to play for you if it meant they had to sacrifice their future. I think so. You know, that was just my experience of being at the NBI. Was it was becoming real difficult. We had a lot of kids starting to leave to go to U.S. schools, and and that's kind of a, a big thing. You know, for me as a player was too, where you know you show up at the ballpark every day. Well, if you lose today or go over four today, there's no consequence to that. Where you know it didn't bother you, and you know I played in the states for four years before going to the NBI, and then those were always the, the fun games, the most important games, or conference games, and you're playing for a national ranking and all that type of thing, it drives you and motivates you. And um, that's the only way you're going to get the top-end kid is when you're actually playing you know, for a national championship. Kids aren't interested in coming out and just playing exhibition games. You played professionally for four years? Uh, no, that was college baseball for four years down in the U.S. Uh, who did you play for? I was at North Idaho College in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And then I actually played a year at uh, Albertson College, who's uh, now our conference rival. It's kind of neat. I still have some of the coaches that, that coach at Albertson still were coaching me when I was there, so I still have a lot of relationships with guys from that school. If UBC had not joined the NAIA, what do you think their options would have been, the most realistic options in terms of inter-university competition? Uh, we probably wouldn't have started the program. Okay, if we would have started it already and it became evident that we couldn't get into the NAI, uh, I can honestly say we would have probably folded the program. There's just no reason to uh, try to run something at the level we've you know, seen running it at the highest level. You know, and if I if I wasn't able to recruit the top kids to come to to UBC to play baseball, to me, there's no point in in running the program. It's the NBI has folded because of the problems they had, and I'm sure that that you know a, a program like that at UBC would have run the same fate eventually. It just uh, would have been too tough to raise money and to get the athletic department's involvement financially and everything else. It just it wouldn't have made much sense at all. Did the option of doing it through the CIAU ever come up? Is this something to which they just were not amenable? 
we were the first ones to really start college baseball in Canada at, at our level. Now there's a few other exhibition programs that were going on, the Prairie Baseball Academy in Lethbridge and the ABC program in Quebec. Now they just run as club teams and exhibition that play all U.S. teams, but just exhibition games. They're both junior college programs. So we were the first four-year uh, school program to start college baseball, and then shortly after that, you saw what happened in the CIU back east start up the league that they've got going back there now. So we were contacted by them, but we were already in the NAI at the time, and then made it you know uh, clear to them that we were very happy with where we were at. We didn't feel that from a travel point of view it would make much sense uh, going east to west. The impossible given the weather in Canada and the time frame from when college baseball plays. We play from mid-February to mid-May, and there's not many places outside of Vancouver, Victoria, the Lower Mainland that you're going to be playing baseball in February, March, and April. The Americans start college ball in January or February, depending on the school, and I guess that would be well nigh impossible once you get out on the prairies of Canada. Right. You know, every year we start our season mid-February, February 14th, down in California and Arizona, where the weather's great. You know, I talked to a couple recruits actually a couple weeks ago in Ontario they still had snow you know and, and so they still aren't out in their field in May in some places in Canada this year so it makes it really tough to try to plan a college program based around you don't know year to year what the weather is going to do for you. According to my records there are eight Canadian colleges in the NAIA now for, uh, for baseball. Uh, U of Alberta, UBC, U of Calgary at Alberta, U of Laval, U of Ottawa, Simon Fraser, U of Vic and University of Windsor. What do you think yep. the advantages are for these schools? What do you think the advantage of being a Canadian school and, and essentially American Athletics Association are? What is it yeah. that appeals about in general, not just from the standpoint of UBC, but for, uh, for all Canadian colleges? What are the perks? We're the only baseball program that's in the NAI. So there's 240 baseball programs in the NAI. We're the only Canadian one that, that plays baseball in the NAI. None of those other schools offer baseball at that level. And then I, I think some of the other uh, schools, they offer different sports in the NAI. The SFU has, uh, they've actually, they're starting to change over to the CIU now, but they still have a few, I think, left in the NAI. But the big advantages to me were from base where we are, you know, uh, so close to the border that we can cross the border within an eight-hour bus ride and play 15 schools, you know, and, and an eight-hour bus ride from Vancouver anywhere in B.C. or across Canada, you're going to find one or two schools that you could play. So to me, it makes the, the biggest sense just from a travel point of view, from a budget point of view of uh, crossing the border, having all these schools that you can play within a reasonable distance where if we have to play the University of Alberta, you're flying, or the University of Calgary, you're flying, and, and uh, just from a budget point of view, it doesn't make much sense. Now that you've managed to uh, get into the NAIA, now that you've gotten the program going, yeah. how do you sell the program to recruits? And parenthetically, do you sell it to the American recruits the same way as you do the Canadian recruits? What are the uh, If I were a competent high school player, which I wasn't, by the way, <laughs> there you um, go. <laughs> but if I had been, how would you have sold it to me? Uh, the big thing for UBC, you know, obviously the kid has to be a great student academically to get into the university. The standards are so high at UBC and, and continue to uh, increase that. You know, my number one thing before I look at the kid as a baseball player, the first question I have to ask, can I see your transcript and see how you do it in school? So, um, you know, if the kid meets the academic requirements, then I'm able to talk to him from a baseball point of view. Right now with the success of the program on the field, the, the kids are not going anywhere else. I mean, I'm able to have a lot of success recruiting the kids, saying you're going to get a top education from one of the top three universities in Canada academically. You're going to play in the best baseball program in Canada that rivals any, you know, NAI program now, and and even some of the NCAA Division One programs. You know, we were two and one against NCAA Division One opponents this year. So now, if the kid has grades and he's an elite baseball player, I don't expect to lose him to anybody. And we're out recruiting a lot of Division One schools right now for Canadian kids. Um, I have kids leaving U.S. schools and coming home every year. Actually, for this year, for September's team, we're probably going to have eight or nine kids leave U.S. schools and come back. They're Canadian kids that are down at U.S. schools, and they're coming back to UBC because I think they, they see it as, hey, the baseball program's as good as the one I'm at down here, if not better. I would be getting a Canadian education, a better education, and playing with people that I either played with when I was younger or I'm closer to home. So that's been the big advantage. Um, so now if the kid has grades, I don't expect to lose them to anybody. We offer scholarship money on par with most of the American schools we compete against, so that's not the issue. We're showing that our players can go professionally in the draft now and, and go on to, to careers in Major League Baseball, so that's not an issue of exposure. You know, Jeff Francis has proven that to be you know non-existent. That's not an argument anymore. And 
And uh, we just focus on the Canadian kids. I actually don't recruit American kids. Uh, it's my feeling that they've got enough places to play down there. This is a Canadian program for Canadian kids that are going to get a Canadian education. You mentioned that you'd scheduled three NCAA Division One opponents last year. Is that right? Right. Who did you play? Uh, we went down. It was a Division One tournament in Phoenix held by the Oakland Athletics at their spring training complex. We uh, beat the University of Portland. Uh, beat the University of Missouri and lost the University of Washington. That's a pretty impressive performance. Yeah, they, that was our actually our first games of the year, and, and uh, we were really happy with how we came out and played. We obviously had two top pitchers, Jeff Francis and Brooks McNiven, who will beat anybody. It didn't really matter who. So, uh, you know, Francis went out and beat the University of Missouri, and McNiven beat the University of Portland. And Washington was the good game. They were they were preseason ranked number 24 in NCAA Division One baseball, and, and uh, the score was actually 2-1 to one in the eighth inning, and they put up five runs against one of our relievers. So uh, we were right there with, with one of the top 25 ranked teams in Division One baseball, which kind of shows, you know, the, the competition level or, you know, how we've developed as a program the type of level of baseball we're now playing let's talk a little more about the players you've mentioned jeff francis already mm -hmm. uh, what do you think his prospects are like i've heard it projected as a first rounder in the upcoming draft right do you think that's realistic yeah or? actually uh i it'll be it's guaranteed that he'll go in the top 20 picks in fact it'll probably be in the top 15 and uh there's a chance i know of a couple teams that are sitting five through ten right now that have some interest in them so it's so tough to tell with what these teams are going to eventually do next Tuesday uh, it's a guessing game and then their head boss will make the final decision on draft day but uh, he can go anywhere from picks five through 15 right now realistically I, I really would be really really surprised if he fell below 15. I think it's safe to say that most major league teams will be willing to take on one more competent pitcher at this time so you got, you got that right especially a left-hander that uh, pitches above his years. I mean, the, I think the thing that they like about Jeff Francis is he might not take too long to get to their big league club. You know, I, I know some scouting directors and that I've talked to that the plan with a kid like Francis is, hey, two years they expect him to be in the big leagues, and that's kind of what the teams that need instant help on the mound. I think they'll be looking to kids like Jeff. How about the kid from Surrey, the one who played on the junior, the national junior team? He's committed to Arizona State. I think his name is uh, Adam Lowen. Is that right? right. Yeah, I know Adam real well. He's actually going to go even higher. He's he will he'll go in the top six picks pretty much for sure. I don't know if number one's out of the question. I think Pittsburgh's kind of leaning otherwise to other places, but especially picks three through six. You know, Lowen is, is projected to go right there, and so he's going to uh, you know go just that much higher than just a little bit higher I think than Jeff might be. It's like I said, it's so tough to tell right now with what the teams are thinking. So uh, you know, but Adam, he's uh, obviously a high school pitcher that's got you know he's throwing 92 to 94 miles an hour and. A uh, real good curveball. He's got a high, you know, real bright future ahead of him, that kid. What are the players like when you first get a hold of them? These are, I would say, entering freshmen, maybe juniors at the outside when you first make contact with them. I don't know if you uh, take a lot of transfers into your program, but what is it like dealing with the players as individuals? How That's much of your job is that of, uh, well, troop leader, and how much of it is uh, master strategist? To me, that's the funnest part of the job is the relationships that you build with your kids. So we take the majority of our kids out of high school. There are a few college transfers every year, and um, there's not much you can do with them. You know, they've, they've learned some things in their first two years and all that, and you're only going to have them for two years. So you just try to bring them up to the level, get them into your system, teach them what you want them to, to be doing out on the field, and that's all you can really do with them. Um, a lot of the habits they've created and that are ingrained in them so much, it's real tough to make major mechanical adjustments to a pitcher or to a hitter. High school kids are a little bit different. You get them coming in as an incoming freshman, an 18-year-old, you know, first time away from home. Uh, from anywhere across Canada, we got a couple kids from New Brunswick, and we got Ontario kids and everyone else. So uh, it's a big move for them, and, and you should see them when they first show up. It's pretty funny, you know. They're they're all worried and scared and intimidated, and you got to take them under your wing, you know, and you're a dad to them. You're their dad now, and, and you have to handle your relationship with them accordingly. So you know, you have to deal with some off the field issues that they they come across as being, you know, young kids like that at a university for the first time and away from home, missing friends and family and girlfriends and everything else. So. Uh, to me, that that's the neatest part. And then, you know, two days ago, I get to go to graduation and see three of my seniors graduate, and uh, two of them have been been with me right from year one, and, and that was pretty emotional. And, and to me, I get as much happiness out of that as I will next Tuesday when Jeff Francis gets drafted or Bruce McNiven gets drafted, and, and they go and start their pro career. To me, you know, and as I get the equal benefit out of seeing hey, a kid that stayed here and, and graduated 
from the University of British Columbia, played four great years for me, um, you know, and now will go on and be very successful in life, just as well as Jeff Francis, who came here, did all the great things on the field and, you know, academically also, but will go out and play professional baseball here. So it's, it's pretty neat to see both levels like that. It sounds fascinating. I was wondering how much strategy the uh, college-age players could handle, how much, of, uh, how much of your job was disabusing them of the notions that their uh, youth coaches drilled into right. their heads. Right. I think that at this age, the uh, the skills are pretty well formed, but the notion of team play is still starting to take root, the idea that it is a team game after all. Yeah, that's a big one, and, and that's kind of the one knock that I do have of the system that, that produces these kids is that there's not as much emphasis, especially when they get in that 16- to 18-year-old age group, there's not as much emphasis on winning and team. It's more to do with uh, personal development, developing you for the pros, a lot of these kids go into these baseball schools, and it's just one-on-one attention, you know, trying to make you as an individual a better player. And they get to college, and that's a big adjustment they have to make is uh, they, number one, aren't used to playing with a lot of pressure on them because they're always the best player on their team from wherever they came from. Um, they're handling negative things for the first time, hey, a slump or, or going out on the mound and getting hit hard. You know, they've never had to deal with this stuff before, so it's a lot of mental stuff going on in freshmen for the first time of having to fail you know how do they handle failure um, you know and that type of thing so when I get into the strategy that the one thing that does help me at UBC is that I'm dealing with very bright kids from an academic point of view and that portrays out onto the baseball field so kids that have uh, you know a good head on their shoulders come from a good background that they t- tend to handle this stuff they understand coaching a little bit better if you tell them something they're able to apply it a lot easier where some of the kids I've had, you know, the younger age group I've had experiences with, they have a tougher time trying to, to, to do what you're trying to, to tell them, you know, to, to handle the information. So I think I'm lucky at UBC to have real bright kids that way where they take things that you teach them and, and talk to them about and they apply them very quickly and, and understand them a lot better. So you have a little bit more success that way, uh, you know, with the UBC kids. It must be difficult to strike a balance between your primary function as coach, which is to win as many games as possible, to win the NAIA. World Series, if possible, each year, and to beat as many Division One opponents as you can, the Missouris and Portlands and uh, University of Washington as the world, and at the same time to make the environment receptive to the players' goals, which are invariably to move on to bigger and better things. None of them yeah. want to be amateurs forever, I'm sure. Yeah, no question. In fact, you know, just because of who I was as a player and then friend, the close friends that I have that are in the big leagues, Jeff Zimmerman and Ryan Dempster and these guys that I know very well, um, actually I, I put ahead their their individual development uh, in terms of the pro game ahead of us winning a national championship for UBC, for example. I think I would like to be regarded our program and me as a coach by how many players I got into professional baseball or got to the big leagues versus how many national championships we won. Uh, now, that's a direct conflict of the U.S. programs we compete against. They're winning number one. Uh, they'll do anything to hold on to their kids an extra year or two, and I'll do anything to push them out of the program. If they get an opportunity to sign, we want them out chasing their dreams in professional baseball. That's just how I was as a player and, and realizing that not many kids get the opportunity to go play professional baseball, so if they do, they're going to go do it. If my UBC players, we're not going to talk them into, you know, stay one more year because we might win more games or we might have a chance at winning a national championship. Hey, you know, go chase your dream, and, you know, I hope to be watching you on TV one day. To me, that's, that's what it's all about for these kids is to reach their ultimate goal. And in the meantime, in doing that, if we have success at UBC in terms of a national championship or winning a conference title, you know, that's great, but that's not number one to me. You know, it's, it's, it's moving them on. I've done a little bit of homework on the subject of Canadian players, and it looks like there's an influx now. There are a number of players coming into uh, the uh, professional ranks from Canada, more, in fact, than since the 19th century, if uh, my casual observation is correct. But at the same time that this influx is occurring, it seems like pro ball is starting to uh, pull out. The independent miners are taking an interest in Canada, but the affiliated ones, not to mention the majors, seem to be uh, investing less in it with each passing year. You know about the Expo situation, right. and you probably know that the Vancouver affiliated minor league team got cut back from AAA to short season A mm-hmm. a couple years ago. And I wondered if there really, if there really was a trend going on, or if it's uh, not as grim as it seems with regard to pro ball. Yeah, I think professional baseball, when you're looking at Canada, you know, professional baseball is all about dollars and cents, and it's big business. And uh, Canada can't compete on the same stage as a big business with the U.S. markets, and that's mainly because of our dollar. You know, we hear that in hockey and and all these other sports, but there's truth to it. I mean, there really is. Uh, Even AAA, the reason they left Vancouver 
Uh, number one, they couldn't convince the city to upgrade the stadium, Matt Bailey, and to build. I think they actually wanted to even build a new stadium or at least get another five or 6,000 seats in, in there. Um, the city not willing to do that or spend that money on, you know, baseball, I guess, is what it boiled down to. And therefore, you got to see, like, Sacramento sitting there saying, hey, we'll build you a brand-new 15,000-seat stadium and to, to, to host you guys down here. And it's a no-brainer from that point of view. So it's just a different mentality up here, I think, to towards sport in terms of supporting sport. And to lose the Expos, well, that's just, to me, it's, it's a direct result of, um, you know, a community not being able to support a professional organization. Uh, you know, us losing our AAA team the same way. Uh, like I said, it's all money driven now. And so if, if people don't come out to watch it or support it and the corporate people aren't involved, you cannot compete with the people across the border. And, and that's, that's to me, the, the side on professional baseball. Um, yet, like you said, we're getting a trend now in Canada in terms of more players coming out of Canada and, and being recognized by professional baseball. So it's kind of weird to me that, that that happens. Yet I think that's the direct result between amateur and professional, you know, where amateur is grassroots and we're starting to run a lot better programs in Canada for the younger kids and we're starting to see the result of programs like UBC where the kids we get now coming through the system are so much more ahead of where they were 10 years ago, so much more prepared for an elite level baseball. So to me that's kudos to the, the Little League coaches and, and the, the organizations that, that run these kids through their programs that when they come out they're being recognized by Major League Baseball and by college teams recruiting them that they're ready to play at an elite level where you know professional baseball is a business it's just a whole whole nother deal what changes in the way college baseball is organized in north america do you predict for the next decade what has it been like being in the naia and where are they headed uh how do you think uh, the ncaa is going to handle all of this the nai uh, as a whole right now they're starting to lose members over to the ncaa uh it's there are two organizations that run side by side as four-year programs. In the Northwest, here we've lost a few teams the last couple of years that have jumped NCAA Division II. So, you know, with the NCAA comes a little bit more money. You know, the, the obviously the football programs, the big-time football programs and basketball programs that run NCAA athletics really fund the whole organization. To where schools like the University of Washington, their athletic department is funded by football. You know, that, that's the thing. They bring in $10 million U.S. a year, the football team, and, you know, that pretty much funds the majority of their budgets. Baseball, they're not a big sport team, big drawing team. You know, fans-wise, they don't make money. They, you know, need money every year to, to live. So I think UBC actually is a, one of the few schools in Canada. I know that we've been in meetings with the NCAA over the last two to three years about potentially down the road. This is a long-term vision of UBC athletics, but that is getting into the NCAA at the Division One level, you know, and then starting to prepare our teams like baseball, playing in the U.S. system to get them ready for such a move if, if we were able to convince the NCAA down the road that this is something that we could handle. Okay, finally, let's, uh, let's bottom line it. You've spoken about the relationship between uh, college athletics and uh, academics. Let's talk about society in general. Do you think baseball is good for Canadians or for Canadian, Canadian society, and what do you think would need to happen for them to, to complement each other better? For what would Canadian society have to do to improve things for baseball, and what would baseball have to do to improve things for Canadian society? Yeah, I think you know the the first thing is just the facilities issue. I know here in Vancouver we really struggle with that in terms of there are not any uh, the only baseball only facility in Vancouver is Matt Bailey Stadium, and that's now leased by a professional team. Uh, we're fortunate to play out of there, but when we're talking the grassroots and, and building up through uh, the different age groups, uh, indoor facilities, badly needed in climates like Vancouver where it rains so much. We need indoor facilities where kids can go in and train year-round, and, and to me that's the biggest thing. And Society has to understand that we've been so hockey-dominated over the years, and here's a sport baseball that seems to be showing a trend upwards and, and we have to have things like facilities in place to be able to handle that um, because the kids that, that make baseball their goal and what they want to focus on they're starting to understand that this is a nine ten month a year deal you know where in the past because of hockey and that baseball was always the sport that the hockey players played in the summer when they weren't playing hockey so i think society needs to understand that that baseball needs to be treated and, and handled in a year-round fashion just like hockey has been in the past where these kids are committed and serious year-round to that sport and, and want to develop in that sport. And then the second thing along with it is facilities. We need to build baseball-only facilities, not facilities that are baseball in the summer, soccer in the winter, 
um, you know, we're, we're, hey, we can be out on a field, you know, we show that we're out on a field September through November, and then we get back out in January through May, you know, and so that's our college season, we're out on a field, and we need a facility that can handle us being outside on a field in that turn, you know, you go across the street and see the other baseball fields that are uh, across from that Bailey Stadium, they have soccer played on them all year round, baseball only gets to get in there April through, through August, you know, it's quite a difference. It sounds like excruciatingly difficult work uh, from your standpoint, having to handle not only the on the field aspects of the game, but dealing with all the stuff in the uh, front office, as it were, the yeah, uh, university, the uh, community, and so forth. It looks like you have to be a professional diplomat as well as a professional coach. At our level, you know, fundraising is a big part of it too. Where sometimes every, you know, during the day, it seems like I'm more of a fundraiser office you know person compared to a baseball coach where when i get out to the field is actually the happiest time of my day because i get to concentrate on what i love to do you know the rest of my time during the day is talking to corporate people and alumni and trying to raise the awareness throughout canada of our program and getting people on board to help support us you know raising scholarship money and there, there's tons of stuff that has to keep getting done to build what we dream you know that we're trying to build here and so a new stadium on campus is a goal of ours and it goes down the lines well thanks a lot for your time today you've really helped us out a lot um, i really appreciate your speaking with me this morning. No problem, Carl. Thanks. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvic.ca. Giving sociology an edge! I perceive that Major League Baseball began in the late 1940s, not in 1871, 1876, 1901, 1920, or any of the other dates commonly cited by so-called baseball historians. I support this claim by noting that the top Caucasian professional baseball leagues that existed before the color line began to go down in the 1940s cannot reasonably be called Major League Baseball. My defense will not be reliant upon the social utility of drawing the line as a way to get even with bigots, although I personally find such reciprocity not without appeal. It is rather an internal attack on the Major League Baseball of those pre-war years, dismantling the notion that the games and pennant races could have been legitimate in and of themselves in the context of the race issue. My initial motivation for such specificity in setting a single date on the dawn of Major League Baseball was the perceptible lack of agreement as to how long the top North American professional leagues have been playing essentially the same game they do now. Television announcers regularly report on a player having broken one modern record or another, with closer inspection revealing that the date of transition used in the particular case may correspond to, tautologically, nothing other than the last time another player was more successful in the given category. The examination of the more perceptible discontinuities in Major League play since the first professional team was formed in 1869 is instructive in other respects. The central precepts of team sport were violated in the days of the color line to an extent that severely contextualizes and perhaps entirely invalidates American League and National League standings and statistics before that time, and the violations stem with logical inevitability from the ban itself. It is imperative to the integrity of an event that is competitive and presented as such that all sides attempt, as a matter of good faith, to win. Otherwise, what transpires is not a contest, but an exhibition at best, a farce at worst. The 1919 Black Sox scandal was not about the Chicago players intentionally playing poorly as much as it was about their intentionally playing less well than usual. The point of law, as it were, had to address the latter act, else any player who threw a game could counter-argue that he hadn't done anything to hurt his team, he had only declined to help it as much as usual on that particular day. 
This rhetorical ploy was known by early 20th century baseball fans and administrators to be used by would-be game fixers and approaching players thought to be potentially helpful. The popular term for intentional underperforming was laying down, implying a more passive and less detectable variety of subversion than flagrant misplay. The ban on blacks playing in the American and National Leagues created a conflict of interest in players that discouraged them from full display of their talents. As in Las Vegas, where every successful new strategy employed by gamblers is made illegal upon discovery by the casinos and the biggest individual winners are rewarded with an informal request to leave Nevada and never return, the professional baseball players of the day were subject to attack on the race issue if they became too good at what they did. Babe Ruth himself was suspected of being a, quote, secret Negro, close quote, a claim which he felt compelled to deny frequently throughout his career. His denials may have been rooted in whatever racism he harbored personally, but the prospect of his being removed from his profession, however slim the probability, must have motivated him as well. Did it perhaps motivate him and others with a little extra ability to burn to keep a lower profile on the field? It cannot have encouraged better play on his part. Less prominent players also had to be concerned with passing the, quote, race test, close quote. For example, teams wanting to use Cuban players had to establish that the players in question were, quote, true Cubans, close quote, that is, as opposed to black ones. Some of the players so examined passed the test, and some failed. Player abilities are largely developed by the individual player. A young person begins to hone baseball skills at an early age. The young person spends certain amounts of time and energy on batting, throwing, running, and other skills. Development is largely a function of this allocation. Later, when coaches and managers become involved, it is still the young person who has to execute, and the physical and mental processes that accompany every action of the eventually mature player can still be said to spring from the player's own past and present regimen to a great extent. The call line could not have been reasonably ignored by a prospective professional baseball player. Players had to allocate a certain amount of their stamina and intellect to beating the band continuously, evading at every moment of their pre-professional and professional lives. Certain players did not have to worry as much as others about it, which only added to the inequities it caused. And, as with Ruth, those who survived the entrance exam still had to worry, at least in theory, about becoming good enough at the game to draw negative attention and possible witch hunts, with the resulting absurdity that it was possible for a player to be too good in what was supposed to have been a competition. Taking practical steps to prepare for race scrutiny, or at least the player's anticipation of its becoming a non-trivial influence on his career, necessarily compromised player training effectiveness and performance in league games. The resulting contests were not entirely about who played baseball the best. As the ban was an informal one, never appearing as black letter law in any official American League and or National League documents, the individual teams were technically at liberty to field black players from the beginning of the 20th century and before. That they did not attempt to do so, preferring to participate in the unspoken moratorium, violated the principle of competition as well. Some cooperative elements, inevitably, must exist for league games to be held but blanket immunity for collaboration cannot be granted in an environment in which competition drives the validity of the enterprise to such an extent. It is difficult to blame the successful teams for preferring the status quo. It is easy to blame the perennial losers for not hiring all the black ball stars they could and going to any extreme to see to it that none of their opponents got too rambunctious with the new talent. The athletics of the late 1910s, the Red Sox of the 1920s, and the Phillies of the 1930s would unquestionably have benefited from having had Rube Foster, Martin DeHigo, and Ray Dandridge, respectively. Preferring to take the easy route, these teams effectively threw season after season in the same way the Black Sox threw the 1919 World Series. They couldn't be bothered to try. Is there anyone who can explain why watching a game in which one team is losing on purpose is worthwhile? I am not referring to situations such as the insertion of the mop-up reliever in baseball or the third-string quarterback at the end of a football game. Those situations are marked by the presence of two mitigating factors. The teams are cutting their losses so that they have a better chance of winning future games, and the personnel on the field, 
given their identities, are still trying to win the game if possible. No conflicts of interest exist. Even conceding for the sake of argument that the athletes in the American and National Leagues were in general superior to the black ball mainstays in pre-war times, a concession that one might well prefer to describe as falsehood, the former were compromised in their ability to pursue the goal of winning to a perceptible extent by the side effects of the COLA line. Teams that abdicate the goal of winning in favor of deliberate suboptimality are not teams. They reduce to triviality the completion of the games in which they engage, games which are the only evidence their league has to offer of its legitimacy and worth. A thrown game is no game, and the games played by the American and National Leagues during the days of professional baseball apartheid were thrown games in the strictest sense of the term. The pre-war pennant races took place in the shadow of conditions that were measurably more racist in certain major league cities than in others. St. Louis and Boston, for example, were often cited as worse towns than most for blacks. To claim that the racism and regional fluctuations therein were irrelevant since there were no black players in the majors at that time is like saying that racism is not a problem in all white neighborhoods. For example, Forsyth County, Georgia, became noteworthy in the early 1990s for not having had a black resident in several decades. Closer examination suggested that the absence was a result of conditions so inimical to blacks that none had remained in the county long enough to have been rightly called residents. It was the social condition in question that had caused and maintained the demography. The concept of the level playing field is not strictly enforced in baseball, with franchises building their teams around their parks and, on occasion, their parks around their teams. However, there are and must be some restrictions on home team advantage. Minimally, killing off or maiming for life opposing players is and must be implicitly forbidden. Such an observation may seem ridiculous now, unless you have lost a relative to a lynching and there are quite a few people alive who have. It has been nearly 50 years now since Brown v. Board of Education was first addressed by the U.S. Supreme Court. A lot of people who are around then are around now, or at least their first two or three generations of descendants are, or they should be. It would be petty to assess the historical effect of regional pockets of racism solely in terms of how they have influenced baseball games. That is not to say that one cannot, conversely, assess the games in terms of how they have been influenced by regional pockets of racism. Why should the manager of the Chicago Cubs, for example, have to cave in to those who would maintain a hostile environment in St. Louis by leaving any of his players home when playing road games against the Cardinals. If I had been managing the Cubs in 1935, I would not have left Gabby Hartnett home for a road game against the Cardinals. Had I been managing the Cubs in 1998, I would not have left Sammy Sosa home for such a game. The implications for fair play of having to leave any number of players home for road games are obvious. Racism did have a casualty count and the pervasiveness of its more violent aspects was such that not even a baseball game could take place in certain parts of the country without being influenced by it. One hears often that history is written by the winners. Examined more narrowly, history is written by those who are still around to write it today. It follows that any version of history which a given group promulgates at the expense of other groups' ability to compile, not to mention circulate, other versions, must be looked upon as suspect. It is not petty to mourn the effect of genocide on discourse. Eliminating persons with knowledge of a culture has been a historically effective way of curtailing the presence and influence of that culture in general discourse. As the individuals who sustain the culture are dispatched, the culture itself naturally succumbs to attrition. Is there a black American, Canadian, Mexican, Cuban, Honduran, Salvadorian, Belizean or Falkland Islander alive will maintain that the exclusion of quote colored men close quote from the American and national and indeed federal leagues between 1884 and 1947 had no measurable effect on the game as played by these leagues? To claim that the damage is done and cannot be undone, and that it is best to let bygones be bygones, is to accept and reinforce the aims of the initiators on the color line. If one dismisses the loss incurred by the game, never mind the persons thus excluded, as not worth examining. 
one is guilty of upholding the color line oneself, in the sense that the color line was a line of propaganda that was sustained by passive as well as active destruction of opposition and evidence that might serve opposition. So far from having no choice but to accept what transpired under such twisted circumstances as valid, one has no choice but to throw out the results. This practical and theoretical imperative is binding for scientific reasons as well. Reality control encompasses diddling with the conditions before the testing has begun, as well as throwing out subsequent results that one does not like. Without taking this statement to be true in the extreme, I note that history is consensual. Some range of popular assent would be a necessity in redrawing the line initiating modern Major League Baseball history if it were to be put into practice. To maintain that the color line was not of sufficient import to merit selecting 1946 or 1947 as when modern Major League history began is to take on the counter-arguments of quite a few black Americans, Canadians, Mexicans, Cubans, Hondurans, Salvadorians, Belizeans, and Falkland Islanders, in addition to taking on the responsibility of coming up with a more logical year for candidacy. Are you so worried about Babe Ruth being stripped of some of his statistical legitimation that you never even think to extend the same amount of concern to Josh Gibson? Did your parents have to use the side or rear door to the stores in their hometown? The doors are still there in the rural south, by the way. Their isolated and architecturally inefficient presence along otherwise featureless long brick walls, a tangible and measurable reminder of exactly how willful the segregationists were about ensuring their ideals. Did you have an older sister with a gift for numbers, who nonetheless received little or no math education while not too bright kids went to public schools that were better funded than your siblings by several orders of magnitude? We won't even talk about the so-called literacy tests that were administered in the United States to blacks but not to whites to prevent the former group from voting. If you really think that Jackie Robinson was an inadequate augur of the world to come, don't convince me. Convince a black woman or man, or better still, convince someone who wasn't, quote, really, close quote, black, but who got pigeonholed as such early on and never escaped the label. Because until you do, you will never ever get the consensus necessary to establish any other time as historically more significant. And if brushing them off in the hope that they will ultimately grow weary of arguing and go away is your preference, I remind you that it was the failure of this approach that allowed the color line to go down in the first place. It may seem hard-headed of me not to believe the pre-1946 American League and National League to have been Major League Baseball. With Ruth, Wagner, Matthewson, Gehrig, Hornsby, Cobb, and others spending their careers playing in one or both of the two leagues, one may ask how I could not regard them as having been Major League. My response is that, on the contrary, I didn't regard them as having been baseball. Race is a term that is often used, not without cause, synonymously with assigned social role. Assignment of a given player to the white group or the black group was ultimately at the discretion of the commissioner's office, which was the authority of last resort on such matters during Kennesaw Mountain Landis' term in office. The assignment of status was even made explicitly by Landis in some cases, with a given organization trying to classify a player as white, but being thwarted. This operationalization of whiteness was such that, once it was in place, competition among the teams in the white leagues could not possibly have retained integrity. This was in part because the team wasn't truly at liberty to improve itself under such a system. An upwardly mobile team could not freely scout, recruit, acquire, develop, or trade players under such a system, since their fortunes might ultimately hinge on whether Landis's temperament would favor them in a particular case. With such a specter at the end of the tunnel, teams gave up on certain players just to be on the safe side with some of the players being dismissed before they had had a chance to play for the organization at all. Even more of a conundrum, given the simple-minded taxonomy employed by the baseball establishment, must have been the issue of how to deal with Cubans and Polynesians and Native Americans and Arabs and Mexicans of heterogeneous ancestry and so forth. The ban on, quote, blacks, close quote, presupposed that race was univariate, dichotomous, and discreet. With such tepid assumptions as the foundation of their conceptual model, the racists made it impossible for Landis or anyone else to be, quote, fair, close quote, within the context of its application, there being no logically consequent standard against which fairness could have been judged. I expect the racists would have said that they just knew who was white and who was black, a statement whose articulation would only have supported my case.
A lot of people don't think of sports, and is particularly looking at game theory as necessarily sociological. I've enjoyed what you've done this week. The idea behind the Don segment is that context counts. You can't look at the game after the call line went down and the game before the call line went down and say, this is the same game. The way they handled it was so different, the black letter law notwithstanding. The color line never was a black letter law, was it? It was a de facto policy that was made in the head office. It wasn't written down somewhere and said blacks are excluded from baseball. It was oral tradition only. There were any number of times where Landis, the uh, commissioner at that time, just said, we're simply not going to uh, allow this. And that was that. His word was law. And uh, the Supreme Court of the United States sort of upheld his word as law, saying that baseball was a sport, not a real business. And one, one points out that that decision came in the middle of possibly the most corrupt era in the history of American politics, which is saying something. Yeah. One wonders exactly who had to get paid off for that one to come Are down. you suggesting that a Supreme Court justice might have been paid off I'm suggesting by that it's Major po- League Baseball? I'm suggesting that it's possible. These guys had a couple of bucks even then, and everybody else in the country was for sale in those days. Why not the judiciary? Even if it wasn't that blatant of a conspiracy, it's obvious that it was part of the hegemonic flavor of the day. Somehow, baseball was America's game. And when they said that, what they meant was baseball was white America's game. There was a sense of superiority of the game and the superiority of white players. This is a really good environment to study legitimation. There are still people who look back at the pre-1946-47 major leagues and call them the major leagues, not the white leagues. And that baffles me. It's like the, the, the rationale seems to be, well, they were racist, but we're just going to pretend they weren't. And I feel a little weirded out by that. For one thing, there are plenty of blacks playing ball then. They just weren't playing in the white leagues. There are any number of sources you can consult, printed sources, about who was who in black ball. I have a couple of them on my shelf. And weren't there rumors of different players who were in the white leagues that they had black backgrounds, that they had, quote, Negro blood? Yeah, you hear about that as well. There were rumors about uh, Babe Ruth, I've mentioned, accusation. There were also some cases... John McGraw of the Giants was constantly trying to get players of uh, dubious pigmentation (laughs) onto his club, and he ran himself ragged doing it. You hear a lot of stories about what a jerk he was on a personal level, but one thing that was true of him was he wanted to win. And he went crazy trying to find ways around the color line. He succeeded in a couple of cases. He got in a couple of, quote, Cubans, close quote. And the issue of whether, quote, Cubans, close quote, were black, white, or indifferent was one that baseball hadn't really considered at the time. They decided to draw a line between the black Cubans and the white Cubans, the result being that Adolfo Luque got to play in the major leagues and Martin DeHigo did. Black is not an objective, ontological thing. It's something that they were constructing, whether they realized it or not. They being Uh, the powers that be in baseball at that time. The point of the Don article was that if you want to draw the line of legitimation and you want it to be a singular one, as opposed to announcers just constructing one that makes the story more interesting on a case basis, uh, then that's probably a good place to draw it. There are people who draw it in any number of places, draw it in 1871, 1876, 1901, 1920, and so forth. And I think uh, I think you'd make an excellent case for 46, 47. I think I think it's an inescapably important change in the way the game was played. Not because racism is bad or anything like that, but there are implications to racism. The construction has implications that wreck the possibility of reasonable competition. Sure, because you're always worried about whether or not the I'm next sure, guy is going to be constructed is not white. I'm sure Babe Ruth was an excellent athlete. I'm even more sure that Hannes Wagner was, that Walter Johnson was. Uh, but they were playing a game that was not what it pretended to be. The subtext of the game, the context of the game, whatever the term would be in this case, was such that it made the game from a contest into an exhibition. An image of the real contest to the extent that the contest can be defined metaphysically. I want to talk about legitimation a little bit because UBC joining the NAIA speaks very well to it. Yes. Uh, I got the impression from what Terry McKeg said to me in the interview that he's interested in putting together a baseball program at UBC that is reasonably good by American standards, by the standards of American college baseball. And one might argue he already has in the five years that he's been there. Oh uh, Yeah, you could. 
the way he chose to do it, the program is largely his baby. His vision was such that he thought that joining the NAIA was the only way to permit recruiting of the kind that he would need to do. You can't cut off a player's chances of future employment without certain repercussions. The obvious one being that no player who's especially good is going to consider your school. No player is going to go play for a dead-end team if he thinks he has any chance of making the pros afterwards. And what that means for Canada is that if there aren't Canadian schools that meet that criteria, then the students that are coming out of high school who want to go to college, who eventually want to go to the major leagues, are going to seek college scholarships south of the border. And you have a drain not only of baseball talent out of Canada, but you have a drain of college talent who are going to America and learning under American schools. And that has hegemonic concerns for Canadian culture, because what you have is young people being educated American style. And while American style and Canadian style education are similar in a lot of ways, it nonetheless is flavored with American culture. And I think that came out in his interview that one of the things that he was concerned about was actually recruiting Canadian students. So they had a chance to go to a good Canadian college. And that keeps not only their baseball talent accessible to Canadians, but it also ensures that good college-educated students are coming with a Canadian education instead of an American education. You also mentioned in your intro about the conflict of consuming. As baseball has dried up in Canada to a certain extent, the big major leagues are going south of the border. We may lose Montreal. It may be that Toronto will be the only Major League Baseball team in Canada, we will not be able in Canada to consume baseball on a Major League level. They're taking the talent south of the border for the most part, using those players, but with that talent goes an interest in that talent. So there'll be a lot of Canadians who will be interested in watching the Rockies, for instance. And that comes with American commercials and more American culture being introduced into Canada. Maybe. I think that it begs the issue of legitimation. I think that what happened with hockey, to a certain extent, was that the Canadians formed a backlash against what the NHL was doing, which was essentially pulling all the teams south of the border. They haven't done all of them yet, but there are six teams left in Canada. And what one of the effects of that, I think, has been that Canadians are a little more unwilling to consider the pro game the be-all and end-all. They still watch the Stanley Cup playoffs. You'll never get that out of their system. But they're also a great deal more interested in all the other levels of the game. Before so it could be a good thing in disguise for Canadian baseball? I think it will democratize it. I think that it's entirely possible that the reaction will not be that everyone in Canada will just watch Major League Baseball like mindless sheep and never consider the alternatives to the product. I think that they're already starting to play recreationally. The uh, recreational participation here is a lot greater than I anticipated. And I think that they'll be more interested in the youth game. I think they'll avail themselves of the other varieties of the product we call baseball. I think that's just as possible as the possibility that everybody will just give up and watch the American teams. And if Toronto's on, watch them and put up with a league in which 29 of 30 teams are American without, without ever looking at what drives that league without looking at, as I said, the context and the subtext of that league and deciding, you know, this is something other than a sport at this point. This is everything that's wrong with sport. One of the things that surprised me in the 94-95 strike was that there were people saying there was, quote, no baseball, close quote. And there was baseball in 95 before the strike was resolved. There was college baseball, uh, high school teams, again, a lot of participation. And these alternatives exist. I think increasing returns functions to a certain extent. The best players go to the schools with the highest profile, and that makes the highest profile schools better able to recruit good players. And I think McKeg is trying to acknowledge that and take advantage of it to the extent that he can, given his resources. I don't have a problem with that. I think it's inevitable that one bows somewhat to visibility issues, to positioning issues. Both factors are at work. On one hand, people want to see the best of the best, and they want to see them concentrated in one league. And on the other hand, it's possible for people to pursue other versions of the product as well. been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable 
and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. Music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural, or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.